There's this meme going around on various social media. The pictures and the words change, but the message is very similar, and it usually includes a picture of a pie of some kind. And it says, equal rights for others doesn't mean fewer rights for you. It's not pie. It's not pie. Our, our lives and our world are not pie, and they are not limited to eight pieces. This meme is countering a scarcity mentality, the idea that there is only so much to go around. And if you get more, I get less. There's quite a bit of scarcity, scarcity thinking these days. A lot of it, of course, is based on fear. Sometimes it really does feel like we're slicing up that pie into eight pieces. The pandemic has made us feel more protective and more limited. And as the world gets scarier, we often tend to withdraw and think in terms of scarcity. But what really is scarce? Water, food, land, air, these things can be scarce in some places and in some circumstances. But often, that scarcity is because we don't manage them effectively or wisely. We see the earth as a supply closet rather than appreciating the power of our interdependence. Or as part of the capitalist system, we compete for access, access to resources in order to derive profit from them. Capitalism encourages a competitive scarcity mindset. We are taught what we have is not enough. We need that new thing. This mindset permeates our culture. Now, there are some people who naturally have a scarcity mentality and others that have a mentality of abundance. It depends a lot on your circumstances, your genetics, your upbringing. And scarcity is not just about money, though we often think of it in those terms. There are plenty of rich people who have a scarcity mentality and plenty of people with limited means who live with a sense of abundance and offer the world abundant generosity. Organizations can have scarcity mentalities. Churches can have scarcity mentalities limiting their potential with this fear that there's not enough to go around. Scarcity can be a lens by which we view our options and our world. Our mindset really matters. I ask you, are love, creativity, beauty, joy, are they scarce? Only if we believe them to be. An attitude of abundance starts with appreciating what you have rather than focusing on what you don't have. But it also acquires a more expansive appreciation of what is possible. And it requires a willingness to take a role in bringing it about. Our culture has offered many ways, many philosophies and religious ideas about how to develop this attitude of abundance. And there's one that's been around for more than 100 years that I just find really intriguing. It's called New Thought, or the Law of Attraction. Maybe some of you have heard about that. This belief system is based on the idea that people and thoughts are made of pure energy and that energy attracts like energy. So positive thoughts will attract positive things, positive outcomes, allowing those who generate the right energy to improve their health, their wealth, their personal relationships. There are Christian and secular versions of this new thought from the mid-20th century book, Think and Grow Rich. I remember... Um, when I worked in a bookstore when I was in college, 
you know, that book was already like 50 years old. I remember putting it on the, the shelves of that. One of the biggest bestsellers of all times, Think and Grow Rich. To the early 21st century book, The Secret, one of Oprah's favorite books, also made into a movie. Abundant life and prosperity gospels are Christian versions of this philosophy where God takes the role of the provider of the good things. So having pure thoughts and intentions will result in God blessing you with what you need and what you want. I think this law of attraction is interesting because it does have some value in my mind. In terms of scarcity and abundance, we are more likely to see abundance in the world if we have a positive and open mindset. If we envision what's possible rather than think about the limits. Our thoughts can affect our choices and thereby, thereby affect the outcomes. But I have two fundamental difficulties with this line of belief. What does it mean if your thoughts don't attract what you want? Did you do it wrong? Are you not worthy of getting your needs met? When you, when you put God into this equation, does it mean that God's favor shines on those who have more? That they are more worthy of having their needs met or their dreams come true? As a you-you who believes that all are worthy, this is troubling. But my second concern about this line of thought is the focus on the individual. Abundance is created and enjoyed as a shared thing. In community, we experience abundance more deeply because we are creating it together. We are manifesting it together. As interrelated beings, we're not in isolation. Having an abundance mentality can make a difference in our lives, but it can make a difference in the lives of others as well. And someone else's abundant philosophy can affect our own lives. Abundance is not about having what you want, but rather about noticing what you have and multiplying it through the manner of being in the world. If you want an abundance of love in your life, start by contributing your love to the world, and the abundance will flow back to you. The abundance will flow through and this community. This is a theology that I can get behind. So I wanted to bring you a story that would illustrate this point that while we can have abundance in our own lives, it is when we connect with others, when we share respect and love that we know true abundance. I chose that familiar, I'm sure, to many of you story from the Christian scriptures about the loaves and fishes. This is one of the only stories in the Christian scriptures that appears in all four of the Gospels. So each of the gospel writers felt that this was an important story. It's a simple story. Jesus was preaching to a crowd, and his disciples were concerned because all they had to feed people was the offering of a small boy who had a few loaves of bread and some fish. As the story is told, Jesus blessed the bread and the fish and starts distributing it. And soon there was enough for everyone, an abundance of nourishment. Some Christians interpret this as a sign of Jesus' divinity, that this was a miracle of multiplying the loaves and fishes. Multiply them until there were enough for everyone. But there are other ways to interpret this story, waves that I believe are actually more consistent with Jesus' teachings. He had been spreading this message of love for our neighbor, love and care for the least among us. 
That was one of the most significant elements of his teaching ministry. So perhaps the crowd was responding to his message, responding by sharing what they had, just as the first boy shared what he had, just as Jesus had taught them to do. Now, it's likely that that young boy with the few loaves and the few fishes was not the only person in this crowd who had food. And so as the meager food supplies made their way around the crowd, someone may have added some fruit from their pocket or perhaps a loaf of bread that they had in their bag. And and following what Jesus had taught them, those who contributed shared what they had with the community without concern about who was contributing or concern with who was not contributing. They were expressing the love of their neighbor that Jesus had taught them. They were expressing an abundant love, abundant care for those who were present. According to the gospel, after the meal, the people said, this is indeed a prophet who has come into the world. Yes, indeed, he was the prophet who inspired them to share their food and create abundant community. That brings us to UUSS, to the abundant community that we're creating right here. (laughs) Abundant love, abundant caring, abundant community. We create this in so many ways. I imagine you can think of ways yourself. I think one of the ways that we create abundant community is how we care for each other. One of our members told me about how they had recently moved into a new apartment and they posted on our internal Facebook page that they needed help with moving things. They felt surprised and grateful when people they didn't even know showed up to help them. People from this church who offered their care, their abundant care, to one among us who needed help. Another example that stands out for me was several years ago when one among us shared in their stewardship testimonial their gratitude for the love and support this community had shown when their family had been taking care of their spouse who had cancer. They stood in this pulpit and cried, and we cried too. Those of us who knew the story cried, and those of us who didn't know the story cried. Abundant love, abundant care. I think of Barbara Amberson, a longtime member who died a few years ago, someone who was just woven into the fabric of our community. She left her entire estate to UUSS. Her retirement funds from her job, a small IRA that she had accumulated, her entire estate. A statement of her love for this community and a gift that has sustained and enriched us. All of us contribute in our own way to creating and sustaining our abundance. This is called stewardship. Stewardship is actually a wonderful word because it means taking care of, looking after. Through your stewardship, your gifts of time, talent, treasure, of caring and loving and sharing, we sustain our abundance in this community. So I can't do a stewardship sermon without talking about our mission statement, which is fine with me because I love our mission statement. We come together to deepen our lives and be a force for healing in the world. I really love that it starts with we come together. That's the most important part of a mission, don't you think? We come together, a reminder that we are not separate beings, but are weaving the fabric of this community. And there's a wonderful energy about this statement, the coming together, the deepening down, the going forth. 
we come together to deepen our lives and be a force for healing in the world. I love the energy of that statement. We live the force for healing part of our mission in the world by the service and justice work that we do. Each of us can be a force for healing by how we choose to live every day. And as a community, we can be a force for healing by the work that we do. But we're also an abundant force for healing just by being here, by being in this place with our hearts and our doors open. Every Sunday, newcomers come through our door, and many find what they didn't know they were looking for when they got here. They find a sense of community. They find a spiritual home. They find us. Our new worship associate today, Don Hebner, did a marvelous job. Thank you, Don. She originally offered her reflection to our monthly religious services committee meeting, and I really wanted you to, sh to hear it. She was quite vulnerable in that story, sharing her feelings about her move, her, the vulnerability at various phases in her life. I wanted you to hear it because I wanted you to remember what it's like to be new to this community. That vulnerability that longing, that uncertainty. Anyone new who comes through our doors is courageous and vulnerable, whether they are new to Sacramento, new to Unitarian Universalism, or often both. They are our future. So we're launching our stewardship campaign today a two-week window to make a financial contribution to our community for the next budget year. But we're also funding our future. Could the people who started our congregation in 1865 imagine us? Imagine the abundance. They started meeting in different halls and small groups. They didn't even have their own home for 50 or 60 years. Could they imagine this abundance? Can we imagine the future of our congregation in the 21st century? Can we imagine sustaining this abundance? Being here for whoever needs us. Being here to reach out to our world to be a force for healing. Abundant commitment, abundant love, abundant community. Now and in all the days to come. May our vision be realized. May our hearts be open. Blessed be.